because the animals are their own selves and if we wish to connect they either will connect with us or they won't. There'll either be a sense of agreement and arising to that or not and that would be their authentic truth. When it comes to humans though it's a little more tricky because all, all humans whether you know, shamans or healers or, or ordinary walking around in the world kinds of folks all of us are very occupied in our five senses and with our conscious minds every day and yes we are intuitively connected already we just don't really know about it consciously because we're so busy with other kinds of thoughts connection or um, intuitive connection is often automatically there with people who are already emotionally close or with people who with whom you've had a very strong bond or mutual purpose uh, or healing intervention or some kind of caring uh, scenario so two things are true firstly the intuitive connection is already there between you and whoever you've encountered you know it is already there and um, if you would like to the other thing that's true is that you may not be aware of it as an actual conversation and if you do want to engage in a telepathic or intuitive conversation a to and fro sending and receiving with another person then it's always a good idea to speak with them about it in the normal sense to speak with them first and to get their agreement so that you know there's definitely trust and that everything has been stated um, but there's no boundaries to it actually being true it's just a good idea to speak with the person first and to get their agreement um, and then to continue spontaneously or at at very specific times that you want to actually have a communication distance is no barrier and this can be a very fun way to practice, by the way, as well. If you want to find a, a telepathic buddy to practice with, you can practice sending each other you know, colors or shapes or mental pictures and see how close you are to getting it correctly. It can be a lovely way to practice with someone with, that you do, you do trust. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Anna. Ian in the lighting booth. <laughs> so, um, people may not be aware they've seen the cameras. We have about 50 people around the world um, joining us. Great! <laughs> and um, I've got two questions. The quick one is um, Art in San Diego would like to know where he can get your DVD from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the longer question from Becca is I always feel bad about animals being kept in zoos. Mm -hmm. Are animals aware that their species need help and are zoos helpful? Hmm. Great questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> the answer to the first question is really easy. The DVD is available for purchase as a Region 2 DVD, which means that in San Diego you would need to play it over uh, through a computer, Mac or PC, because Region 1 DVD is not yet available. Nonetheless, there you can either find details on the resources page of my website, animalspirit.org, or you can go straight to the online um, catalog, the online company. It's kalahari.com. Kalahari, like the desert, K-A-L-A-H-A-R-I. Kalahari.com, and they do ship worldwide. They've already sent several to California. The second question is a very good question, and I came into doing this work um, in animal communication in, in a very sideways manner and it was by actually volunteering at zoos and animal shelters and in conservation programs and I was very distressed by the state of a lot of animals in those captive environments because they are very unhappy a lot of them have got that glazed eyed look where they're not really engaged anymore um, they just have lots of people's thoughts and worse you know, objects being thrown at them on a daily basis and they just disconnect they disconnect from their reality as a way to keep sane inside and and become just really you know, very depressed so the thing is uh, I'm certainly not going to go into justifications for why zoos are helpful to have people you know go to see animals and at least care about them and I also certainly never buy into the argument that zoos and breeding are necessary for saving the wild species so many places pretend to be conservation programs and breeding to save the gene pool when they're actually just tourism establishments making money off entrance fees. But having worked for at least 10 years in these kinds of environments, there were individual animals that I would come across who were very, very clear in themselves that their purpose was to live in captivity and to touch the hearts and the minds of people who came to visit that zoo or that park. And they were the animals who were always bright-eyed and welcoming 
It doesn't mean one could touch them. Sometimes you could, sometimes you couldn't. That wasn't the point. They didn't need physical touch. But they were very clear that their role and their purpose was to be a, an ambassador for their wild cousins so that they could help uh, have people experience them and therefore perhaps care, care about that species and therefore care to help or donate money or other resources towards saving the habitat and, the, and their wild cousins. So I would say on a case-by-case -case basis, one would need to look at the individual animals there, how they are feeling about it. A lot of my work, at least half my work, is with wildlife, usually in captive scenarios or in relocation programs or programs to return them to the wild. And I'm called in to ask what the animals need to be more comfortable, to have their lives more enriched. What do they need on an activity level, on an environment level, food, diet, interactions and all those sorts of things. So to say that all animals in zoos are just dying to be free would also be not true. That would be a generalization. At the cheetah park where I volunteered on weekends, we often had people come and get all sad and say, oh, look, that cheetah just wants to run free across the African plains. Meanwhile, most of those cheetahs had been born in captivity. They're very well fed every day and could think of nothing more scary than being out on the African plains having to find their own food. <laughs> so it really comes down to the individual animal. It's pretty obvious if an animal is happy or unhappy in a captive scenario and what I can suggest and how we all can absolutely help is if we visit such a place is to send them compassion, to open our heart centers and to let them know that we really see them, we really see them, we feel for them and with them. Don't pity them. If we feel sympathy towards them or if we pity them, that's not very helpful. That just makes them feel even worse and it's very disempowering. Better to send them unconditional love and to essentially just say and to feel, you know, I see you, I see you, and to hold them in the light. And that honestly does improve their experience of their life that day for having been fully seen and having had a touching moment with a person energetically. Great. Question. Um, I, I wish to appreciate your being here, first of all, but I have two questions. One is, uh, do animals like spirit form an, um, an emotion from a feeling? Mm -hmm. was, it, was the feeling that he, uh, in, when he was brought up, did it create an emotion? And do animals understand emo human emotions? Mm. Is the first part of your question, are you asking, does the animal have an emotion come up? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Right. Um, animals are very, very present and boy, can we learn a lot from them. From that point of view as a spiritual state of being you know animals are so present which means yes they do have um, feelings come and go and reactions to things in perhaps an emotional way but those don't tend to last those feelings won't last they don't really hold grudges unless you've been away from home for too long and your domestic cat lets you know when you get back <laughs> but they have feelings yes they do have feelings and they would experience them as emotions they might get a flash of aggression or a sense of um, longing or sadness, uh, so they certainly do. But they don't attach to them in the same way that humans do, and they certainly don't, after the fact of feeling it, sit around and think about it some more. So they don't just tend to sit there and think about feelings. But of course, if they feel the same thing around a certain person, often enough they have memory as well, and they can know what's causing their distress, or they can describe what situations do. When it comes to the question of do animals understand human emotions, <laughs> They know we have them and they read human emotions absolutely accurately in the moment, but they don't understand why we have so many and why we're so conflicted and why we, re we react so much. Um, animals are very aware that most of the time we are, we are not present. So they sense our emotions, including if we are unsure. Uh, you might be out at the park or on the beach and you see someone whose dog has got away from them off the leash and they really, really want the dog to come back. And the person is very angry that the dog has got away. But they know that anger is not going to attract the animal, the dog, back to them. So they might be calling the animal, the dog, you know, here Fido with a sweet little voice and even offering a treat. And here Fido, good dog. But behind their back, the dog can't see. You can see they've got a stick. And they intend to beat the dog and you know, punish it when it gets there. And you'll see Fido's response. Fido is hearing the right words and the right tone of voice. He's even having the treat dangled and everything looks good. But Fido is unsure because he can also absolutely sense the negative intentions of the person. 
he can sense that all is not well, that there's something else happening in parallel. And so Fido might come back a little half-heartedly with tail between the legs, you know, sort of getting mixed, get, getting mixed messages. Because a lot of the time we ourselves as humans are just mixed up in our, in our own heads. That's also another reason why it's impossible to, um, to fake confidence around animals. If you are genuinely feeling afraid or feeling fearful, they will know that. You can't pretend not to, because they'll pick up on that frequency. Yeah. Is it okay to ask a question about my own animals and the situation mm -hmm. we're in, please? You're welcome to. I will just say I won't be able to tell you why your animal's doing what you're doing. Oh, right. If that's because I'm not a behaviorist and I don't believe in generalizing, so no, it's not. so in a situation, I would say we would have, one would have to ask the animal why they're doing what they're doing, what their reasons are. But if it's still relevant, um, mm. as a it, it's actually about um, my three female guinea pigs who all have cystic ovaries, mm -hmm. and I'm and everybody I've spoken to is at a loss as to why mm. we have this problem. Mm. And I'm not quite sure what to do about it. Yes, quite. If, if you have a situation where all the animals in the household are displaying the same sorts of symptoms like that, um, it would imply there's something going on either in the environment, physically you know, or energetically, or that they're taking on, unless they're related to each other, and it could be a genetic thing. Um, so there, there are often energetic reasons for animals' ailments, particularly animals that live close to people. They might um, display an illness that is actually trying to give us a message. So a domestic animal may develop a liver disease and perhaps they're trying to tell us we should have our livers checked out or that we are too much in the emotions that are associated with liver, like anger, resentment, those sorts of things. Sometimes animals take on a physical illness to help us not get so sick. And, and that might be um, an act of service on their part and therefore an appropriate choice because they're making it from a centered place within themselves. Sometimes animals get sick though because they're reflecting to us what's going on or they've ident over identified with us and it's not coming from such a centered place in themselves. Yeah. But the thing to do in that scenario would probably exactly to have a communicator ask all three of them together. Um, do they know? Animals, most of the time, actively know what's going on with themselves and why, what, what the causal reasons are. Yeah, thank you. And yes, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I have recently um, have noticed around um, my friend's dog, my friend's dog usually really jumps at me hmm. when I go near it. And I've noticed recently that I've been, actually I've been sitting with my rabbit and being quiet and choosing, and choosing love, being more, working mm. on my own centeredness. Mm. And I've noticed that recently the dogs stopped jumping at me. Great. Which is just amazing. I no, I've noticed yeah. it, I've thought about it, I haven't really said anything but mm. I've noticed it. Mm. And I wondered about, um, if you talk a bit about how animals respond mm. to our fear. Mm. So if I'm fearful, then does that bring a certain does that bring a certain response or reaction? Mm. Do they respond? Do they react? But they very often they very often do. If if we are feeling fearful or nervous in ourselves, animals will definitely know that, and they might choose to move away and stay a bit away from us. Therefore, because they just feel misunderstood, particularly if it's for example a large breed dog. That, is, that you, you know, I've been at the vet before with a friend's dog, a big German Shepherd, and the mother and her eight-year-old daughter walked into the vet's reception area, and when the mother saw the German Shepherd, she grabbed her daughter by the arm, actually hurting her daughter, and said, stay away from that dog, he's dangerous. Just because he's a German Shepherd, and he's the biggest teddy bear, the most gentle dog I've ever known. And so animals feel that. They feel assumptions, they feel negative um, opinions about them. Um, and they feel our fear. They may choose to just recede or they may come towards us if we're feeling fearful. And then again, there might be a couple of reasons. Um, sometimes they can just sense fear in the field, really, right around. And that makes them think, gosh, there must be something scary here. You know, there must be something worthy of being fearful. So everything just sort of escalates. They think less clearly. We think less clearly. They just sort of get very tense, even if they don't come towards us, but they might get very tense because suddenly fear is in the field and they go into an instinctive high alert state. 